Dr. Sean Anderson is the Departmental Chair of the Environmental Science and Resource Management Program at California State University Channel Islands. That's right. That's, that's a mouthful. I, I had to write that down just to make sure I remembered all of that. But if you were here last year and heard uh, Dr. Anderson's lecture about the Thomas Fire and its causes and effects, I, I think you found it very riveting and you probably learned a lot. I know I did. And this year now he's taking us one year later to really understand what's now become California's year-round fire season, the, the new abnormal, and, and what we're living with now and, and the impacts of that. So kind of taking it up another level. Now, I do understand there, there will be a test at the end of this lecture. So, so pay attention. And Well, we might not have a test, but there will be Q&A. So if you have questions, pay attention. And we will have about a 15, 20-minute Q&A at the end of the lecture. So you'll have a chance to take part in that. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Sean Anderson. If we're, if we're sitting around, you guys could snap that and look at some videos, but forget that. Screw that. Let's go. Okay. Oh, my God. Blue screen of death. Okay. This number next, pretty please. Okay. Perfect. And then next one. Okay. So um, uh, this is uh, if you fall asleep while I'm talking, um, which is a normal occurrence. I guess I can put... No, oh, that's good. Now I can put this down and hold my beard. So that's actually really good. Um, so... <laughs> So the takeaways are the world didn't end, right? The world didn't end. The, the screen didn't. The world didn't end, right? Um, there are several things that we can do to make things better. Um, and those include some policy things. Those also include ways we can dialogue with one another. And um, uh, yeah, so um, while we're... I see it's technology. I picked up the beer, and clearly that the technology didn't like, did not like me picking up the beer. Perfect. All right, good. Thank you, dear. So um, the last thing I'll say is, oh my God. again, it's budget cuts. Again. Um, so is is the last thing I'll just say is um, in the midst of all this craziness, right? Some of us have lost our homes. We've lost friends. We've lost so much stuff. It's very easy to get frustrated and angry with the progress that we've made or haven't made. But truly, we are in this golden hour right now. Um, so I'm just about to get on a plane with my students to go to Louisiana, where we've been working for many, many years in the wake of Hurricane Katrina and the Deepwater Horizon. Uh, we work in different places around the world. We are incredibly blessed here in Ventura. For as hard as we have it, and as not money and all these kind of things, we really are in a pretty amazing place. And we're relatively wealthy compared to most places in the world. And we're relatively forward-thinking in terms of trying to talk about wildfire and what's the best way to deal with fire and all this and that. So we really have gotten as crazy as the Thomas fire was and the Woolsey fire and the Hill fire and all these others. Um, it, we really are sort of poised at this point where we've got a little bit of breathing room. Now that, that those fuels have been abated, we can actually do some planning. And so this is really, even though it might not seem like it, this is really a golden hour, if we will. Oh, yeah. Sorry. I have to talk like this. All right, good. 
Okay, number next, pretty please. All right. So um, this is the 33 in the wake of the um, uh, Thomas fire. And as we all know, it was, it was a crazy time. And a lot of times it was hard to see what was coming in the future. Number next. Um, here is in gray is the outline of the Thomas fire. Um, and we now know, if you guys came to the lecture last year, but if not, if you guys have just been reading newspapers and things, that we are in a burnable place. In this, and burning is a natural part of our ecosystem. And essentially the Thomas Fire filled in this huge chunk of area that had not burned in the last decade or so, or two. Um, and so now, congratulations, we did that. Number next. Um, so last year I was sitting here talking about the Thomas Fire mostly. We'll talk a little bit about the Thomas Fire. Number next. We then had the Car Fire. Another big fire, this one in Northern California, number next. Uh, the Mendocino Complex fire, which was a little bit of a cheat. A couple fires merged together, and we called it a complex. Um, but that fire happened, number next. And then, of course, the Camp Fire, the crazy fire that killed 85 uh, people and took out about 20,000 homes um, uh, earlier in the fall, number next. And then, of course, our, another of our biggest local fires would be the Woolsey Fire, this one running from... Um, a Simi Valley to the coast. And so that was all just in the period since I last spoke with us, right? Not even talking about all the much more numerous smaller fires and things of that nature that we have around here. Um, it, it really is crazy the uh, number of fires, the magnitude of fires, and how quickly these fires are moving. So this particular fire, um, so I, get, I am often away when the disasters happen. So when the Springs fire happened that hit our school, uh, CSUCI, uh, in 2013. I was at Olivas Adobe with my son on a field trip. And I was like, well, that looks really interesting. What's going on over there? And it was school burning, basically. Um, when this one happened, I was with another group of my students down at a meeting in San Diego. And my, my son and my wife called me and said, oh, it's a fire. It's called the Hill Fire. And it looks kind of scary. I'm like, whoa. And then they said, there's also this little teeny fire called the Woolsey Fire, but it's not very big. It's out in Simi Valley. It went from Simi Valley to the Pacific Ocean in four hours. And, you know, if you're in a car, you know, maybe you could get there in 45 minutes or an hour, right? Just driving on our highways going six miles an hour. Incredibly quickly spreading this new era of fires that we find ourselves in. Number next. So this is the figure I showed you last year. Don't worry about it. A lot of numbers. For, it's okay. I have a beer too. Um, so last year, this had 20, because I thought that made it a nice round number. It's, you know, the 20 largest fires that uh, have hit California. Now, we started recording wildfires in 1931. So the first year of, or the policy was set in 1931. So we first started recording them in 1932. So these are all the fires on record since 1932. And you can pick your favorite metric, the size of it, the number of structures, etc. cetera. Um, based on size... Um, these are the 23 largest because I had to add in these three fires uh, from last, uh, between last talk and this talk. And so there's 23 fires. 12 of, this, of these largest fires we've had in our state history have happened in the last decade. So this is not evenly distributed. These are not a periodic thing that come and go. We really are seeing these incidents expand and happen more frequently than um, was our experience before the last uh, decade or a few decades. And just an example of this I showed last year. So this is an image from a satellite looking down on our part of the world using very sensitive uh, sensors to look at light pollution is what it was designed for. And so you see the LA, you know, giant LA sprawl and all this and that number next. That was before the fire. And this is the Thomas Fire. So the Thomas Fire is at the scale in terms of brightness and in terms of stuff going in the atmosphere is at the scale of urban Los Angeles. It, it, these, these things are hard to get our arms around. Number next. Um, and again, as I said before, this, these fires are often moving very, very fast. The Camp Fire, the Woolsey Fire, all this and that. This is a plot of the spread of the Thomas Fire, and the colors refer to the day. So we start here at the beginning, and as we spread to the right, we go step through different days. And what you see is the, not an even number of of uh, not an even amount of land was burned every day. Rather, we had this huge spike at the start, this big giant green thing, right, that starts by Thomas Aquinas College and runs all the way out this way, as you guys know, hit Ventura. And then we had another event uh, back up over here that ran towards uh, Montecito and towards Santa Barbara. 
And that is becoming much more normal. This notion of these really wind-driven fires that are spreading um, much more quickly than we, than quote unquote, are, are typical for a, a, a quote unquote typical fire. Number next. Okay, next, we have to talk about global weirding. Okay, so when I was young, er, um, in uh, the 1970s, 1980s, we used the term global warming. So the first paper on, on this phenomenon was published in the late 1800s. It's not a new phenomenon. People have thought about this for a long time. But really the math, the physics, the climatology started coming together in the 70s and in the 80s. So we began hearing in popular culture the term global warming because the globe is, get, on average, getting warmer. Then some folks that uh, disagreed with what the implications of this might be uh, did some study groups and they decided we wanted to make a more kinder, gentler term, and that term is climate change. And in an ironic twist of fate, actually climate change is a better term than global warming. So climate change more accurately describes this world that we're moving into in that, yes, some places are getting warmer, but some places are getting wetter, some are getting colder, actually. So, so, it's, so climate change is actually a more accurate term. I prefer global weirding because that is really what is happening. All of the stuff, all the food that you've been eating has evolved in a very mellow time in the, our, our planet's climatological history. Uh, the, the critters that are in your backyard have evolved with an expectation of when it'll get wet, an expectation of when it'll get dry, an expectation of how cold it will get or how hot it'll get in summer, and that's all changing. So the, the most universal signature of this world that we're going into is much more chaos, much more noisy, much less predictable for all the systems that we care about. Remember next. And so if you click this, if you click this, it should start playing a video. Click that uh, figure. Oh, there you go. Okay, good. Look at this. Animation. Wow. Super multimedia. That's right. Okay, so this is, we started in 1979. Here's the, here's the value, and this is, this is the amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere from, from the uh, pole to pole, equators in the middle. And so we're going through time. So over here, it's very, it's very high tech. I put my beard down. So, okay, so here we're spinning, right? Our, our time is spinning, and we're tracking how much atmospheric CO2 is, go, is, is present. And so as we step through time, now we're at 1993, 94, this is going up. This is what I want you to pay attention to, okay? So yes, it is true that sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, as we sort of have the, the annual lungs of the Earth sucking in carbon or, or exhaling carbon on average. But the point is, it's going up, and it's going up, and it's going up. And so the, we're, we're you know, on this big thing, and this looks scary. Right? And so it's continuing to go up. It's going to stop in, in a little bit. Um, this is very important to understand because there's a tremendous amount of implications for the planet, but also for us here in California with this. We're just getting close to, um, and this is CO2 in the atmosphere, we're getting close to uh, jumping off the screen here now, 2015, 2016, and we'll stop in 2017. And now I'm going to show you what happened back in time. Okay, so now we're going back through time to reconstruct the amount of carbon dioxide that actually was there back in the day. So 1960, and then we're going to keep going um, uh, farther back. And now we're going to go to the 1500s, 1400s, and then we're going to start jumping into a few thousand years ago. And so we're going to keep going, we're gonna, and, and these guys are going to move over. And then we're going to keep going back, and as we get into the 10,000, we're crashing even lower. Then we're going to see this pop up. We have some burps here and there. It goes up and down. But note, this is us over here right? This is us today. Okay, so there is, there's ups and downs, there's ice ages, there's things, but this is where we are, right? So this guy's going to top off at 800,000 years before now, and it's nowhere near what we're at right now. We're about to shoot way, 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 way past this. So right now, we're talking about um, nobody, or nothing that we've evolved, nothing that's evolved in this planet has perceived an atmosphere with this level of carbon dioxide for at least 800, oh yeah, there's advertising. Number next, for about 800,000 years, and we're pushing that farther and farther back every few years. So what that means, one of the things that means for you and I, and for you and I that are worried about wildfires, is the temperature. So this is California's temperature from 1900 through uh, basically now. And yes, there are ups and downs, there are burps, there are all these kind of things that happen. But the key thing is, overall, it's going up. What does that mean for us? Number next. That means if you live in Santa Clarita, uh, the temperature relative to 2000, 
we have some brand new models that are that are quite good that are that are getting better and better every year compared to 2050 that's 30 years from now that's one mortgage right? that's one purchase that's one purchase of a house and, it, and it's crazy but when we buy when those of us don't have a lot of money and we buy a house right it's 30 years what we talk about our planning horizon right so we think hey I'm gonna buy this house and hopefully my spouse and I, my family and I, whatever, we're going to live in this house for 30 years. That's the range that we're talking here. So if we're living in Santa, if, we're, if we bought that house in Santa Clarita, we're talking it's about five degrees hotter on average. That maybe doesn't sound like a lot. That is a lot. Think of all the air conditioning bills or the, or the, the, the everything you have to pay for, the watering bills, etc. This is Santa Clarita. This is inland, number next. So if we talk about right here in Ventura, it's a little bit less. The amelioration of the ocean isn't quite as bad. So instead of being close to 5 or closer to 3 degrees, that's still a lot of warming. And this is happening throughout our state, throughout the planet. Um, if we look at what's been go why we've had, one of the reasons why we've had so many of these crazy wildfires the last few years, let's look at this. Oh my God, it's science. Awesome. So this is temperature, temperature here. So this is lower temperature, higher temperature. And this is the average temperature over the, the previous century. Uh, and this is just for California. And this is, this is the amount of precipitation. Again, low to high. And, and this would be the average. And so the last decade, or, or actually excuse me, the last two decades, are in these gray, uh, sorry, these darker circles. So one, you see that all of these years are hotter, warmer, drier than the previous century on average. And a large chunk of them are also down here in this quadrant, in the quadrant that there's not much rain going on. Number next. Um, and so that has all kinds of implications. One is less snowpack. Right? So we have, depends on where we live in the county, we have water from three places. Ground water pumping it out of the ground. Uh, state water coming up from sort of the San Francisco Bay Delta area. And then uh, uh, California, or excuse me, the Colorado River aqueduct, all that kind of stuff. A lot, most of those, those latter two are fed by things like snowpack. This is the historic snowpack. This is what it looked like in 2015. So all of this is reduce, reduction. The bigger the circle, the greater the reduction in the amount of snowpack. Traditionally, what all of our systems are designed to suck up and use during the rest of the year. Um, and then we've done strange things, weird things. So we've, done, uh, we've, we've taken active measures to convince people to do certain things. We've used uh, uh, all kinds of fear and all this and that. We've used racism and stuff to get people to behave in a certain way. These are from 1944. And these are to induce you to not start a wildfire. Starting in 1904, we created a massively different policy across the country, Gifford Pinchot and the U.S. Forest Service, to, to suppress fire. We should suppress fire. Fire is evil, fire is evil, fire e chews up the wood. We want the wood. We should have the wood paper that just came out three days ago, four days ago, um, looked at this, um, and these are some of our colleagues in Arizona that use tree, that uh, core dead trees and old trees and reconstruct climatological history and wildfire burn history from the scars. And they've now con pretty conclusively shown that we have three eras. We had 1600, which is typically as far back as they go with some of the tree ring, tree ring data, to 1903, and they do this for across the western U.S. This data is just for California. So um, from 1600 to 1903, we had really wet winter, or we, at some times we had some wet winters, and those act as something of a bulwark to stop large fires, to, to make the fire season not as bad. That really seems to have ended around 1903. Starting in 1904, when we have those posters and things starting to come out, and this new policy of suppressing wildfire, um, we, one, we're, we're allowing the fuels, the stuff that can burn, to become much more abundant. But then also, um, and this relates to the climate change thing, the jet stream starts to weaken and starts to be doing some weird things. Starting, and that, that era goes till 1977. 1977 till now, we're now in a, a new world. And so that new world is all this fire suppression plus the fuel buildup, drier temperatures and climate change translates into, since 1977, there's no evidence that wet years help us in terms of fire which is, it sounds very technical and very nerdy, that is crazy. That, that, that's a massive change in the functioning of our ecosystems here. All kinds of implications, not just for the ecology, but for firefighters and, and first responders and all kinds of stuff like that. 
Um, and then, again, global weirding. Remember, global weirding. Things are getting weirder. So yes, it's getting crazy drier and hotter, but it's also getting wetter in some years, right? So the extremes are coming to dominate. And so the most typical one is the, are the atmospheric rivers. And so that's, that's what we used to call, if you guys are older, you've heard the Pineapple Express. Same thing, same thing, right? So this is a bunch of, so here we are in California. This is a bunch of tropical, subtropical moisture, warm, hot, wet air that can hold a lot of water bundled in it. Um, coming up from south of Hawaii, basically, and, and banging on into us, right? So that, ma that leads to massive deluges. Just starting this year, for the first time, our colleagues at Scripps have started a new warning system, a new rating system, just like we have for earthquakes, and just like we have for hurricanes, etc. It's an, it's an atmospheric river categorization system. So the, so the rainstorm that just ended yesterday, that was an atmospheric river category two. It goes from zero to five. And interestingly, I think it's going to be a very, very useful thing for those of us that are living in and around burn areas. It not only looks at the, the amount of rainfall that's coming, how much, how much water might be heading our way, it also looks at what the conditions are on the ground. So is it a burn scar area? Is it maybe prone to be flooded? So it's, it's, it's a really, um, hopefully, useful scale. We're just rolling it out uh, this year. Um, OK, so anyway, so we have this atmospheric river stuff, and then I already told you this, things change in, in, in the amount of rainfall. An average, over the long term, we're going to see less rain in places like uh, California in the next um, I was on my, the phone with my mom the other day, and she said, uh, it's great that we're out of the drought. I said, we're not out of the drought. And she said, yeah, we are. I just read the paper. I was like, oh my god, I had to disagree with my mom. That's very bad. And so they live up in the Bay Area, right? And so I was like, well, OK, you are out of the drought. We're technically not quite out of the dry yet because we're still in D.O. abnormally dry. So we're almost, almost. We have two more year, uh, two more weeks, excuse me, in our rain season. And so it's, it's, there's a good chance we're actually going to be knocked out. Even of the yellow, we're going to hopefully our region, which is the, dr the most um, deviation from the long-term average. We are the driest area in the state, and we have been for the last seven years. So when everybody else has come out of the drought, we're still you know, a little bit here. So, so yes, um, we have had this huge drought, but these last uh, last year, but especially this year, have really, really helped get us out of that thing. At least for this, at least for this year. Remember next. Okay. The other big thing, I know it's showing so much science. I got to get to the animals and stuff. Sorry. Um, but uh, uh, okay, another thing that this climate change is doing is this. So all the stuff that you learned about, all the stuff that um, Dallas rains and everybody talks to you about about the jet stream. There, it's all getting wrong because we've 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 thought of the jet stream as this area right that kind of burbles up around the Canadian border and and and, and separates Arctic air from our air etc and that's what we're used to this is becoming much more normal so you've heard this referred to as the polar vortex um, there's various terms but basically what it means is this massive distension and essentially it's it's a very high atmosphere pockets burbles of air mass that, that sort of destabilize and roll down but what happens is, when, when this defor strong deformation in the jet stream happens, we get this high pressure system that sits over us, and, we, and all the rain tends to miss us. And that's when we have our drought conditions. So you and so we're drought we're droughty, and we're like we wish we had some water. Our friends in Minnesota the last few weeks they're having minus 70 degrees, right? That kind of stuff, and and snow on the eastern seaboard. So th that's because the same phenomenon is sucking down this ultra cold air from the polar region, the Arctic region, down m much lower than we historically have experienced it. So again, this is all the same thing. It's all the same thing. So when someone says, oh, cold, what happened to climate change? They have their head up their butt. They're not paying attention to what's actually happening. This is reality. Number next. Okay. Now, it is true that we have had these crazy disasters over the, over the years. So this was uh, Sacramento. This is uh, 1862, and this is the downtown uh, near the capital, flooded, right? And so we used to describe these things as, wow, that was crazy, you know, once in a hundred years. Unfortunately, these, what used to be considered anomalous conditions, what used to be considered abnormal conditions, they aren't happening just once every hundred years. They're happening with increasing frequency. Not every single year, but they're happening much more often than our, our parents and our grandparents would perceive. Um, so, uh, 
I don't want to get political here, but, but just to show a couple things. Um, this was the old thing, and I could talk about all these for about an hour and a half, which I, I can, not allowed to. This is Turkey, this is Al Gore at my old lab, this is Hurricane Katrina, um, and this is some efforts to try to reach out to broader public. But this is what I want to talk about. This was our then governor, Republican, meeting with the then uh, Secretary General of the UN, meeting with the, the head of the company that my father-in-law used to work for in Silicon Valley, who's a libertarian, hardcore libertarian dude. They're hanging out. And they're hanging out over the technology of this company called Echelon, which was creating smart sensors. How do we create smart street lights? How do we have smart meters, all this and that? We can all agree that these things, that we can engage with this challenge of climate change in a way that benefits everybody, right? That this is creating jobs, this is creating new opportunities, being smarter systems, all this and that. That was then. This is now. That's very dramatic. This is how dramatic I did. I can't believe I did that. Smack at me one more time. Oh, yeah. Okay, right. Oh, yeah. So this is the, this is the era that we find ourselves in now. Number next. And so, unfortunately, our, our leader says things like climate change is a hoax. And that's very depressing, right? So I do not operate in a political environment. I do not want to operate in a political environment. I'm the science guy that comes in and, and says the facts. It's very difficult to, to operate and talk about how we respond to fires and all these other things when the basic reality is not, um, we can't talk about it. So that's a huge challenge. Uh, and then, of course, he pulled us out of the um, Paris Accord. Um, and some people think that there is somebody influencing him. But anyway, number next. Okay, so uh, all of the stuff that I'm mentioning to you has been rigorously tested, has been evaluated, has been looked at by people like me and much, much smarter people, and over and over and over again. I am not throwing out random facts to you tonight or other nights. I'm not throwing out anecdotal evidence, as some people would have you. We need everybody, everybody, need, we need to talk about the facts, we need to talk about the reality on the ground. Okay, so, put up a pause for a second, and talk about what happened with the fire, or, or, or some quick little examples of the fire. So, the short answer is, wait, let's take a sip of the beer, because we're talking about environment now. So, um, so the environmental recovery is okay, is the short answer. Some areas are still hurting. Some areas are, are doing okay. It is not the end of the world. We didn't lose the whole planet and the world didn't stop functioning. But the short answer, very heterogeneous. So, some, so, so not everywhere is responding the same way. So some things, so if we talk about our plant community, so some things burned. And again, this burning is central to the functioning of many of our ecosystems. So without this burning, the system can't do what it historically has always done. So this is a good thing. So some things burn up and their seeds will germinate. Other things will burn up and there'll be a re-sprouting from the, the base, etc. Um, this is above uh, the mission, uh, right after the Thomas fire. This is, I would say, a more typical type of uh, a, a common California fire. So we have a fire, comes through, stuff's all burned up, but we still have stuff. There's still, there's still some things there, some stems, etc. Um, increasingly, what we're seeing with these fires is particularly the case with some of the areas in, in the Thomas fire, but really the case with the Woolsey fire. We're seeing things that are more like this, where there aren't stems all over the place. Everything is just gone. And so the interpret what we think is going on there is that the drought was so droughty that the stems and the plant, the biomass, was already pre-dried. So when that fire came, the whole thing went up. Whereas typically there'd be some amount of moisture in the phloem and the xylem and the, and the tissues of the plant, and it wouldn't just evaporate. Increasingly we're finding these places just evaporating and there being essentially no biomass left on the ground. But of course that's not everywhere. So on our higher slopes, things have been coming back um, not quite as good. The, the areas farther away from water, etc. We're getting a fair amount of weeds coming in here, as you can see from these mustards and things. Number next, and then along our road, this is along the 33. We're getting a, 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 you know, disturbed areas, trails, things that we kind of uh, mush mush around and stuff. Um, we, we're seeing um, non-native, non-desirous plants, invasive critters come in. Uh, but, again, when we talk about more of the flatlands, more of the areas where we have relatively high amounts of water, like this is, this is the canyon just above uh, St. Thomas Aquinas College. 
and this is in, what is this, this is in um, September. This is my son's Boy Scout troops who are hiking up there, and so I put this in to give you scale. So these sprouts are about shoulder height, right? So this is some pretty significant sprouts. So the fire came through, obviously you can see these trees are, are, are burned, but we didn't kill the whole riparian corridor. It's gonna hurt for a little bit, but we have, you know, the, the vegetation is responding. So not everywhere is becoming an invasive, you know, horrible place. Then we can talk about the animals. And so we'll, we'll click through the next ones quick so nobody gets super depressed about, about any dead critters. But, but so, um, so the, an, the, the response of animals, as we've seen since 2013, we started studying this, the, res, the success or the harm to the an, our, our animal friends are dependent on basically how big they are, how mobile they are. And so what we tend to see is big things generally can run away, and smaller things have a bigger problem with that. So small guys can't hey, hey, keep it, otherwise people get sad. Okay, good, okay. So then we have, um, and, and then what we see in the wake of, this is on the, where is this? This is on the 150, this is a skunk. We see a lot of roadkill right after the fire as, as critters start to disperse and try to move around because their habitats are whacked, number next. Um, and, and, and a lot of things die, so deer and things like that, number next. Um, and all kinds of other things, number next. Uh, mountain lions die, number next. Bears die, number next. Rabbit side, number next. Okay, mouse, number next. Okay, okay, we're done. Oh my god. Oh yeah. Okay, right. Good. Okay. 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 All right. Um, interesting things happen when we have these fires in urban areas. So, in the case of the Woolsey fire, we had things like camels and llamas at the beach, which isn't a normal phenomenon. Um, and so that's what we're looking at here. And it looks kind of like hell, and it sort of, kind of was. Um, but everybody survived, right? So people brought their animals down. Number next. Um, and even, you know, things that we didn't bring down, such as this great horn owl, came down and were sitting at the beach and they are just like, what the exploit deleted is going on, right? And so a, an owl should not be sitting in the sand, but he didn't know where to go, right? There was just water out there. So, so a lot of these guys, again, that were more mobile, they can disperse from the flame. They can either run away or fly away. And so they, by and large, weren't, weren't harmed, weren't whacked, weren't knocked down anywhere near as much as the small, the rabbits, the the um, rodents and things like that. Um, and then we have lots of evidence that, again, a lot of these big guys have survived. So this is um, some cameras from Ojai Valley Land Conservancy um, up in Ojai, and here's a mountain lion that's, that's doing his due, number next. Um, and this is from some of our cameras uh, where we're working with the Oak Park School District after the Woolsey fire. We have some cameras in there on, on some of their land. And this is, this is two coyotes coming down, and right here is a gate, and right here, is a house. So another key thing we see is that one of the one of the key places for wildlife in the wake of these fires is that wildlands urban interface. So be, even before the fires, there's, it's it's a great place to be if you're a coyote. There's all this free food and all this garbage to eat, and, and not a lot of predators. You can't see, right? Little teeny micro chihuahuas, so it's no problem, right? Um, after the fire, it's even magnified more so. So after the fire, we see a lot of this wildlife sort of you know in people's backyards, right up on the edge, because there's water there, there's some vegetation there to eat, there's, there's that kind of stuff. So these, these wildlands urban interface zones become even more important in, in the last year um, as the, the regular vegetation, the regular habitats, the regular places to hide are um, maybe still messed up. Number next. Okay, the number next, we should jump through these quick because I don't want to make everybody sad. So yeah, so um, we lost a lot of structures, right? Like right near here, number next. And so we have this fire event happen, and then what are we going to do? And then it's the next morning, and, and, and for all the horribleness that we go through, what are we going to do? Number next. Um, there is the personal loss of infrastructure and, and buildings. There's also all of our, our societal infrastructure, our freeways, and our, and our, our power delivery systems, and all that stuff. Number next. Um, and then we have the systems that keep us safe are also harmed. So in this case, this is on the 33, up high on the 33, and this is redoing some of our culverts that were damaged and clogged and destroyed by either the fire or the immediate rains afterwards. And so one of the themes here, as I mentioned to you, is, is let's look at this as an opportunity, right? As hard as it is and as difficult as these fires are, this is a chance to do something better. So instead of putting the old cruddy 1970, you know, big fro and bell-bottom type of uh, culverts, Let's put a modern culvert in that's much stronger, that can take boulders, that can take stuff being whacked. And that's indeed what our, what our public agencies are doing. We're putting in more robust culverts. We're putting in, more, in stronger things that won't be distended and damaged by the next flood event. Okay, 
Um, let's talk about initial response. Number next. How am I doing on time? Oh my God. Okay. Um, this is a video I could play for you guys, but it's it's. Uh, why don't you click on it just for a sec? We'll just watch a little bit of it, just to give an idea. Um, and this is on my website if you guys want to watch it. And so this is an amalgamation of a few things. We'll watch it for uh, 30 seconds or a minute or so and go on. But this is, in this case, this one in the background that will cut away in a second. This is um, up in, um, what is this? This is November. And this is the campfire. And so these are folks looking out of their um, truck as they're driving through an inf literally an inferno. Right? And, and these go it goes on and on. There's examples from the from the Woolsey fire. This is frequently the way our fellow citizens are perceiving fire, right? They see this with these viral videos, and it's this dramatic thing. It's totally horrible and totally scary, and it all becomes about, oh my God, the story starts with my attempt to escape. Um, the reality is that the story should start before we have the fire. And let's talk about the initial response. So, okay, here, here's the Thomas fire initially. Oh my God, all this problem. Hey, you guys, evacuate if you're in these areas. It's really frustrating. We're in the midst of this when you guys got evacuated. When we get evacuated, it's very stressful. Everybody's scared. You don't know what's going on. You want to be safe, but you don't want to do anything stupid. Never that. Um, Ventura County is incredibly awesome in terms of planning. See, there's the phone call. Proof. Um, uh, one of the things that was most dramatic in the what I found particularly dramatic was in the Woolsey fire. This is the Woolsey fire. So again. Early on, so the fire is broken out just a couple days ago. What's going on? Here's the map of the burn scar. This is from our federal agencies, right? So this is where the, the footprint of the fire was going. And then, and this this was on ABC, NBC, LA Times. You 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 pick it, right? And this this was this this uh, this or a version of this map. Where's the evacuation zones? Evacuation zones are in red. That ain't where the fire is. That's where some of the fire is. Why aren't there evacuation zones here? Well. This is the Ventura LA County line. And so your representatives and your public officials have made their data as transparent as possible. So um, learning from Thomas Fire and other incidents, hey, when we, have, when we have an issue, we're gonna put it out in every possible format we can possibly think of. So it's easy for our friends in the, in the, in the media to grab it and render it. It's easy for you guys as citizens to go on the website and see it versus our friends in LA County, it's a bunch of text. Well, you have to measure. You're on the street X and Y and Z, and then you go this, and then right? I don't have time to do that. You don't have time to go make the fancy map, right? We need tools and information that is at the scale that you need it and our neighbors need it. And Ventura County has been a fantastic uh, leader in doing that. So as a consequence, we could tell where our evacuation zones were, and our friends in LA were kind of checking and trying to figure things out and looking on Twitter and things of that nature. Number next. Uh, we've also used a lot of technology, like we, we can spin up websites very quickly now to provide information to you guys. Number next. Um, the other thing we need is really well-resourced and smart first responders, and those responders come just after the first responders. So in this case, this is uh, this is the um, start of the hill fire. Number next. Um, and the thing to say is, when we had the hill fire and the Woolsey fire and the camp fire, all these things going, we had 6,000 regular, non-seasonal, just regular uh, firemen and women deployed across the state of California before we got to the crazy fires. So all throughout, we had all these fires up northern California, central California, southern California. Um, we had all this warning. So this notion of stocking up our firefighting force in the summertime when the quote-unquote old fire season was, and then, and then after the fall starts, let them go, that ain't going to work, right? We had to go call people from uh, Arizona and uh, New Mexico and everybody to come in. And, and they came really quickly, but it still took them a couple days to get here, right? That's because we're operating on still many of us on this old model of the fire season and the non-fire season. That doesn't exist anymore. The other thing is we need to have more adaptable tools. So this is one of the uh, flying robots that we build in our lab. This is a flying drone with a special sensor. But there's no limit of this great new technology we could deploy. Um, so one of the things we're using is we have a, a grant with the um, California Air Resources Board. <coughs> um, to look for, and I talked about this last year, the fire caught on fire some oil seeps. Right? We have all these naturally occurring oil seeps around the county. We 
question is, how many were, were caught on fire? How many are still in fire screwing with your air quality right now? The answer is nobody knows. So we built the thing, and we went to measure it. And here's a picture from this, morning, this afternoon. Here's a sulfur mountain near Ojai, and here is a thermal signature of a burning oil seat. So here's, here's a consequence of the Thomas fire more than a year later that if we don't um, use all of our smarts and all of our ingenuity and our, and our NGOs and universities and friends and everything, uh, people have been smelling this for over a year, but nobody did anything about it, right? So, so we are in the process of doing a systematic survey to see what oil seeps are still burning with some of our technology. And, and this looks super high tech and very fancy, and I should probably tell you it's super high tech and fancy. But really, it's a few tens of thousands of dollars in my students as pilots. This is not rocket science. You don't need uh, you know, 17 years and all kinds of engineering. We can be deploying these tools much more ubiquitously and all across. So we're working with various fire agencies now to try to help them and see if we can, can um, uh, help them get more real-time intelligence. And then just after the fire is suppressed, um, data for the recovery and restoration. Um, and so, again, all of this, this theme is we need to be more engaged with everybody. And so um, there's this notion of drones being dangerous around fires and, you know, Yahoo's doing stupid things, bad, but, but this blanket approach has really harmed us. So a lot of times after these fires, we cannot get in for weeks because this notion of, well, you know, the firefighting aircraft, the firefighting aircraft was stopped flying two weeks ago. We still can't get in because of the, the bureaucracy. So that's one thing we'd like to change going forward is, is more quickly in there, working with our incident command system and all the important stuff, not, not going rogue or rebel or whatever. But these things can really, really help transform things in the next year. Um, another thing we can do is, is get away from these static maps. This is a typical uh, uh, incident response map. So this is basically showing where the fire is and the different, different firefighting units are deployed. This is printed on a piece of paper. That is ridiculous in today's day and age. Number next. Um, number next. So here is our president pointing at one of these things. So they're great for pointing at. And obviously, they, they, they have their purpose, right? They have their purpose, right? And when, when it's raining and everything, it's great to have this thing. Electronics don't always work. But we've been demoing some things in our lab that are, that are transformational, that are science fiction-y kind of thing, real-time data feeds from firefighters and other folks, real-time with winds and this and that, so we can get much more accurate data as opposed to this thing that might have been printed eight hours ago that our first responders are trying to use as a, as a guide for, for deploying people and stuff. Number next. Okay. Uh, the next thing to say is that we need to have trust in what people are, are telling us, right? This goes for everybody, local officials, state officials, etc. And so um, this, is, this was in paradise in the wake of the fire with our then governor, our governor-elect, and our president, number next. And unfortunately, some things were said. So... Um, so, fortunately, he called the town pleasure for a while, and that, that offended some people that live there. They're like, can't you get her name right, and all this and that. So, a small thing. Seems kind of trite and seems kind of like small and like nitpicky. That has a huge, if, having talked to several folks there, if you can't even, if you can't say Ventura, how do I, are you, are you really paying attention to the rest of the briefing? So that's a real thing. And then this notion of, um, uh, we can rake America great again uh, to, to deal with the fire is, again, just silly. Number next. Um, so we have various principles of disaster. I'm getting long in the tooth. It's almost time for me to, to be quiet here. But um, we have various principles of disaster. This comes from an organization that focuses on, on home ownership and, and, and housing. But really, these principles apply to just about everything we want to. We can apply these same principles, for that matter, to, the, to our animal and our critter friends and everything. Different wording, but the same idea. Ultimately, what we talk about is everybody needs to be included in our disaster planning. Uh, some, some wonderful reporting has come out in the last couple days about the response to natural disasters with FEMA and how the typical folks that get, and I've seen this with our work in Katrina and all that kind of stuff, um, everybody should get help. And everybody is eligible to get help. Not everybody has the capacity. Not everybody can take off work and make phone calls nonstop for three weeks to get through the, the switchboard to get help. And so the ultimate outcome of that tends to be uh, are the wealthier parts, the more um, 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 mainstream parts of our society get, the, get the, res the recovery aid. Our more marginalized friends and neighbors that don't have the economic or the whatever wherewithal get screwed. 
And that is not the way forward in a just society, particularly as we, we're going to be experiencing these types of events more and more and more. Okay, uh, we need better long-term planning. Um, and, and, and this means a bunch of different things. So we, we do work not just on the science side of stuff, but on the social, on the natural science side of stuff, but on the social science side of stuff too. So we do all kinds of polling. Here's some example of that, number next. So this is, these are some questions we've been asking the last uh, few months. And so this is our annual poll that we typically survey between about 1,000 and 1,500 people. These polls are all done. Uh, Northern Los Angeles County, Ventura, Southern Santa Barbara County, so our region of the world. And some of my students are in the audience and they're like, Oh my God, they're so horrible, it's so much work. You're welcome. Okay, so, so the question we asked was, um, okay, so the fires of 2017 and 2018, um, did they, how did they impact me, right? And so this first survey here was from September 2018, and we did another version in, in just last month, in February 2019. And so about a third of, and the, the error here is about four to, four to six percent, so four or five percent is the error rate of this polling. And this is everybody. This is randomly encountered public. So this is not liberal folks, not conservative folks, not old, not young, it's everybody. It's cross section. And so a third of folks said they were not impacted at all by the fires, right? Somewhere uh, around 40 to 50% of the folks were impacted initially, depending on what fire we're talking about, right? That's a huge proportion. Even if they're only initially impacted, that's, ha that's about half of our fellow citizens. That's crazy, right? This should be a very high priority for our, our uh, elected officials going forward. To this day, right, is at least a, in this case it could have been, you know, a few months, but in this case it was at least a year. And we're talking 10 to 15% of our folks are still significantly, um, either, either they lost their job or they lost their house and, 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 and all that. And then, and then there's a, a few folks that aren't sure. But this is the value, right? We need to be doing this up all the time. We can't just sit on high and say something about raking something. That, that's irresponsible. Number next. Uh, the next thing we can, uh, when we ask, so we ask another question. We ask, hey, so do you think climate change might have played a role in, and we ask various things. So in this case, this is in the Thomas fire. Okay. So again, when you read the newspapers, this is not the takeaway. Here, you watch the cable news. This is not the takeaway. This is the reality. Again, this is for us, for our part of the world. So if we, this is people said, somewhat likely, very likely, or unlikely. If we, if we smush it together in the bottom and be quick, about 13% um, about of the people thought it was unlikely that Thomas Fire was, uh, was you know, climate change had anything to do with it. About 9%, you 10% know, were kind of neutral. 72% said, yeah, I think it probably had something to do with it, right? Number next. The next one is, what about the drought we're just leaving? 81% of your fellow citizens think that climate change had you know, at least something to do with it. That's the reality. Don't be thinking it's us versus them. Don't be thinking it's one to one. The vast majority of our community understands that this is a real challenge and are being adult about it and are, tackle and are interested in taking adult responses to deal with this. Okay, the last thing uh, I'll, I'll talk about is we'll, we'll segue on to out here and, and ask some questions um, is the I actually have something else after this, I lied, I'm sorry. Um, but, but the one thing that has become incredibly apparent to me, and, and to probably many of you, is the importance of resilience. The other thing that doesn't come to play in these discussions of more wildfires and whatever, it, it, it looks static. It looks like it's a graph. And um, the reality, as many of you know, is very, very, very different. So our year started with um, some crazy stuff that happened with some students that, that got hurt. Uh, then Halloween came, and this is, this is just the last semester. Right? Then Halloween came, and some silly person with a gun was on our campus and doing some stupid stuff with a gun. A gun campus shut down, you know, evacuated, all this and that. Uh, then I took my students down, I mentioned before, I took my students down south for a conference, and the borderline shooting happened. So 48 of my students were in the borderline including one student right in front where the jackass was shooting the gun and all that kind of stuff, so thankfully she was okay. Um, an, an unknown number of my alumni were at the borderline. So in the midst of this, of this conference down in San Diego, where we were all safe and sound, one of my students disappears. And I'm like, where, where is she? And she's in the bathroom crying because one of her friends was just uh, killed. Right? 
we come home, and so, so, so get her home safe and all that kind of stuff. Um, we come home, and uh, more craziness ensues. Um, not only are, are am I evacuated, and everybody's evacuated, the Woolsey Fire is going to the beach and all that kind of stuff and craziness, um, but um, other things happen. So this is a friend of mine, Don Canestro. He um, was the guy that first brought me into science, first hired me. He was a researcher at, at UC Santa Barbara, where I was an undergrad. Um, he passed away diving the day after the Woolsey Fire started diving on a project to monitor the changing ocean conditions of our coast, right? And, uh, and then it goes on and on and on, and other, other, all kinds of other craziness happens. This is the world in which we're in. So it is not, generally speaking, having a disaster. It is having a disaster upon a disaster. The borderline started, right, 24 hours, less than 24 hours later, the Woolsey Fire burned through. 75% of the city of Thousand Oaks was evacuated. And that is the reality. How do you how do you how do you roll with all this? How do you how do you juggle all these things? We need to plan for this specifically with our businesses, with our families. All of this stuff. Being resilient is key. This is a really cool display up above Casitas uh, uh, that people made. So the fire reveals a lot of stuff, including trash. Instead of picking up, these folks made sort of a bottle tree. Number nine. And so we need to very, very seriously think about resiliency. Now, resiliency is a, is a very sexy term and very popular these days, number nine. Um, other words we could use would be strong, would be flexible, would be rebounding. And these are not just words, and this is not just some motivational speech. We need to build this into our policy. We need to build this into our ecological restorations. We need to build this into our planning so when these inevitable gigantor fires come through, or whatever the disaster is, we don't just give up the ghost and say, oh my God, it's too big, right? It's much easier to be resilient if we were purposeful ahead of time about building our muscles or whatever the mechanism is so that we can be strong when the event happens on the next day. And so, so that includes us being strong, but also includes uh, nature, right? So one of the key things that the land trust does is help us make not just our people strong, but makes our land strong. And so the last section here, number next, um, let's talk about planning. All kinds of problems. People like me get up and say depressing things, oh my God, the world's ending, blah, 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 right? So I'll say things like this. Oh my God, deforestation. Here's deforestation across the world from 2000 to 2017. All the red of, of areas that have lost trees, number next. And the area is basically going up through time. So we're chopping down more trees. Uh, also, where we choose to live, we choose to live near trees and near shrubs and things like that. Same thing, this is California now, and this is places essentially where we live where wildfires can be happening. But the positive thing, again, I'm not blowing smoke up your butt. I'm not trying to be kumbaya. This is a real thing. We have an incredible history here in Ventura County specifically about working with people that see the world differently than us, or at least we think see the world differently than us. So for example, there, here is a, a pump jack, a, a oil rig, and these guys are um, talking about stuff they've done to make sure that that activity doesn't harm condors, right? Sounds like maybe a small thing, that's a huge thing, right? We can work together. We don't have to be, you're an a-hole, you're an a-hole, you're evil, you're evil. We can actually work together, and we need to work together. Um, small examples, big examples. All across the city of Thousand Oaks, starting the last a month, a few months, um, all these things about um, using some of our master gardener friends to do native plantings of these medians that are typically dominated by, by store-bought exotics and things. Let's put some killer native uh, plants around. In the next. You guys can be involved with that. Uh, right now, in front of this, the county of uh, Ventura, they're, they're still taking public opinion, uh, public input is our wildlife ordinance. So people have called me from Florida in places around the country to ask how this thing is going. Um, again, I'm not saying it's perfect, and I know some of our, our neighbors and friends have issues with this, but the point is we're trying to do planning with the movement of critters in mind. That is crazy, that is awesome. You guys can, can provide input, number next. Uh, this is, here's our county, these are, these are some of the corridors that we're trying to prevent, to help, excuse me, not prevent, trying to preserve. 
So when we talk about that was a bad that was a bad flip. I probably need another sip of beer or something when I sit. That that's horrible. Okay, so um, the key thing here is this is part of wildfire stuff. Absolutely no question. So when our critters are disturbed, are scared, are are you know flushed out, these wildlife corridors connecting isolated patches of, of important habitat for them become even more important. What does this ordinance mean? This is for this is for unincorporated parts of the county. Number next, this ordinance says that there's a, a bunch of things, but long story short, it says things like lighting, right? It doesn't say you can't have any lights in your house. It just says, hey, instead of having like a spotlight blasting out into the the meadow all night long, maybe we can do something different. Right? Maybe we can have lights that point down so you can still see how to safely get into your house or the barn or whatever, right? But in a way that doesn't screw with the movement of mountain lions or whatever. Really, really important. Number next. Perhaps the most controversial area is the area by Terra Hada over by Moore Park, where there's a lot of concern. Our, our, our friends and neighbors there are pretty concerned. But this just shows how incredibly important. So these are these are crossings around um, some of our major roadways, right? So the work that folks like Ventura Land Trust and Santa Monica Mountains Conservancy and these different entities that work for our good, all of our good, um, it's really really important that we express our voice and and not shout out the folks that have concerns about this, but hear them out and actually work to make these types of ordinances really effective. That is key to wildfire planning and recovery. Number next. And then another one that might be a little controversial. So, you know, Ventura County and San Diego, we've led the state in terms of this notion of clearing a lot of ground around our houses or structures. So 100 feet, right? Boom, clear that sucker out, and then we'll be safe. Um, that might not be the best thing. Some, of the, some recent data is showing that more like 82, 84 foot clearance is, the, is maybe just as good. That sounds like, what, dude, 10, 12 feet? What are you talking about? Are you drinking too much beer? The answer is no, because I've been talking. But um, the other thing is that um, that will do as good a job at structure protection, etc. but it doesn't create fodder for invasive species on that other chunk of, chunk of area, right? So we should be careful, not just, again, everything needs to be questioned. Everything needs to have data. So why do we have 100 feet? Because it says 100. People thought that was a nice, sexy number. Right? And so understandable, but going forward, is that the best way? Maybe we can have the same level of protection with a little bit more native vegetation. And then, of course, you guys should go out and join some of the wonderful activities that are, there you go, clap loud, clap loud, that's good, that's good. So you should um, join the Land Trust and similar organizations. And not just join, you should go participate. One of the best things, one of the best ways to exercise your demons, one of the best ways to not be depressed about all this crazy stuff that the weird professor says, is to go out and do something. Plant that tree, plant that shrub. We need a lot of help, need a lot of labor, right? And it's a great way to spend a Saturday or a Sunday or to take your family out, and it's really, really fun, and it's really, really cool. So another key thing, this is just as important. I showed those graphs across the planet. This, we need this going on across the planet. So we can do that here. You have wonderful organizations that are designed to help you get out there and do that stuff. So I encourage you guys to do that if you've not. Number next. Okay, so the last thing I'll leave you with is um, uh, Mitch Hedberg, a, a, a very funny comedian that my wife and I saw just before he, he died many years ago. Um, his wife uh, just started going through his stuff. And he's a really funny dude. If you haven't seen him, you, sh you should watch his comedy. It's very, very funny. I find it very funny. Um, but uh, she's going through his papers and she's getting ready to, it was too painful for the last 14 years or whatever it was, so she is going through his papers and she's putting them out there and, and wants to you sort of, you know, all kinds of writings he hasn't published. And this is a piece that I thought was particularly uh, helpful for us. So he said, ask your dreams where they're going and hook up with them later. And so that's how we get through this crazy climate changes, crazy more wildfires, crazy more stuff, right? is we need to think of what the vision where we want to be. Don't get depressed. Don't like, drink beer all day long like I would do or something, right? But actually, let's envision that future, right? And we have a shot at making it. This really, truly is this golden hour that we're in right now. We People are looking to us, and they're following the examples of Ventura, the county of Ventura, the city of Ventura, Ojai, all of our local entities are doing, 
And we get calls all the time. How did you respond to that? How did you respond to this? Let's be that leader and let's have that clear vision. So number nine. Okay, so the last thing is a bunch of words. Who cares? You guys are way too tired. I've gone on too long. Look at that. I went on so long. Um, so the world didn't end. There really isn't a fire season anymore. We just, we're in this just fire time. Every, we have fires in December, whenever. We really need to think more holistically. These impacts are playing out over years. The recovery is really community and location dependent. I didn't even talk about home recovery, but that you guys, you guys probably know that well. Um, and we really need to plan for this notion of resiliency, right? Let's plan, let's expect a bunch of horrible stuff to come back upon back upon back to back to back to back, and let's be ready for that. And let's, as much as we can, be prepared for those kinds of things. And then lastly, we really are in this golden hour. Let's not waste it. Let's use the opportunity of this fire and these fires to engage with our neighbors and our, our fellow citizens to move us forward. And I think that's all I'm going to say. Thanks, you guys. I went, I went too long, sorry. I, I'm supposed to go shorter. No questions. Say again? Uh, I don't have the exact latitude and longitude, but it's, it's a sulfur mountain. On top of sulfur mountain. Yeah. And, uh, it's, well, yeah, I mean, I guess technically, I think it's outside the city limits, but it's, so if you're in Ojai heading towards Santa Paula, it's, it's out that way. So, yeah, so we have, so the story with that is um, we started getting calls right after the Thomas fire. People are saying, I'm smelling, I'm smelling uh, burning oil. And so our friends in the Ventura County, um, uh, you know, the fire guys went up there. Or, or to the various homes or areas, and they're like, yeah, there's oil burning here, you're right. And so um, all the vegetation, mostly, all the vegetation had burned, and so there wasn't a threat of a fire going and taking somebody's home out or business out or whatever. So there wasn't an immediate threat. And that one picture I showed with, with the burning seat that was right on the 150, they did put that out. The problem is these are just like oil fires. They're not as dramatic, but they're the same thing as an oil well fire. And so once the fire burns for a few minutes, it starts to go sub, subsurface, and it gets its own oxygen and fuel from the, the, the vein. So you can't just throw water on it. It won't put it out. So you have to, it's very complex. You have to use crazy chemicals and all this stuff. So you can't just put a, 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 a tanker dumping on it, right? You need to sort of bring a pumper truck with special things. And because many of these locations are not next to a road, our, our friends in the fire department can't easily get to it. So there isn't an immediate threat of, of fire to, to life or limb. It's logistically hard to get to, and they only have a limited budget. And so uh, and so what we've been doing is we're, we're starting to fly uh, areas of the... And then also a lot of it is just this very inaccessible country, which is very hard to get to. And so we've built these special robots that are three-parted. So, so the first thing is they have really good cameras so they can see if there's smoke. That's the first thing. So that's one way to locate them. Next thing, which you saw there, was a, a very high-tech, uh, very expensive uh, thermal uh, infrared camera. And so that's looking for the heat signature, looking for the, the burning close to the surface. We don't know. We haven't found any with the third sensor. The third sensor is, sensor is called a volatile organic uh, carbon sensor, so the VOC sensor. And it's, it's smelling for essentially burning stuff. And so we think that's important because there's at least a suspicion that some of these fires, so the area in our county um, has always had oil. It's what, what the Chumash were used to make the pommels, all that kind of great stuff. Um, and at least in the 1800s, some people mined them. Well, a lot of people mined them, but some people mined them with shafts. So they actually, like we do a gold shaft, like, you know, dig down into the, into the ground and then you know, chisel out, chisel out, and put wood beams and stuff like that and go down into it. Um, and so most of those have been abandoned, who the hell knows, 100 years ago, 120 years ago. So there's no maps of those. But there's anecdotal reports of perhaps many of them out in the backcountry. And so the concern is that some of those caught fire and the timbers burnt. So they brought the, the burning down deep, but so deep that you wouldn't see smoke and maybe you wouldn't see heat. So the sniffing is a way to, to see if we can find um, the, 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 the chemical signature of the stuff. And so, our, so what we're doing is we're, we're out getting ready to start doing this, this um, 
uh, a systematic survey, and then every six months we'll go back and look to see these areas are still burning, because that has implications for our Air Quality Control Board. Um, and and this, this burning oil is really, really bad in terms of this stuff. It's like a, it's like a gazillion million cars. It's not just like a, a little fire in a house. And so potentially, we don't know. It might have no impact on the overall air quality of our county. It might have some significant impact. So we're trying to track that. Uh, oh, yes, sorry, yeah. A quick question. The wildlife corridor, I know the Board of Supervisors is going to be voting on it soon. Yes. Do you have a time and a day for that? So I believe it's the 12th. I believe it's next, is that right? Right, so next week. So next week, so I would encourage everybody to be there if you, if, or in, in voice your opinion, whatever that opinion is, right? Voice, yeah, right, sorry, so it's, it's at the County Government Center, it's the Board of Supervisors. Um, if you can't be there, because you have to be at work, whatever, you can write a letter and have a public comment and submit that before the 12th, and that'll be entered into the record. That's it. Awesome, more beer. No more questions. Yeah. Unless there's more questions, I don't know. I'm beer. I thank you, everyone, for coming. I'd like to thank again our partners at the Ventura County Community Foundation for supporting us and partnering with us tonight. I'd like to invite you all to join us. Go to VenturaLandTrust.org. Find out about our next event. We've got the Monarch Madness coming up at the end of the month. And I think one of the messages from Dr. Anderson, each of us individually can make a difference. That's why the Ventura Land Trust exists. Join us. We'd love to have you. Thank you.